Welcome everyone. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the Center for Latin American Studies. We're really pleased to be hosting the event this afternoon. I'm going to briefly introduce our guests. We're very pleased to have Deborah Yasher with us. She received her PhD here in political science. And I'm not sure I need to say anything else. <laughs> uh, she currently teaches at Princeton. She's in the Department of Politics and International Relations. She co-directs uh, the Project on Democracy and Development. Uh, and her work focuses on the intersection of democracy and citizenship. Uh, she will be giving a talk, and then we hope to have time for questions, comments, and discussion. So please join me in welcoming Deborah Yasha. Well, I have to say, it is incredible to be back here at Berkeley and to see all of you here. I understand from Harley that actually the semester is over, so I don't even know why you're still in the halls of Barrows. <laughs> but, um, but thank you all uh, for coming. And a special thanks to David Collier, who extended the invitation along with Harley Shaken. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, not only for this event, but I have to say since I'm here, also for tomorrow's retirement party. So I'm, I'm just delighted and moved to be here. Okay, so let me tell you what it is that I'm, I'm going to do. And I thought what I would do is to start off with a story. And those of you with whom I had breakfast this morning, you already heard a little bit of this story. But several years ago, I went back to Central America and I thought, you know, really what I want to do is I want to look at democratization again. So much of the theorizing about democratization has focused on non-civil war cases. We think about why democracy, why authoritarianism, but the theorizing really had not taken into account at that point conversations and understanding of the dynamics associated with civil war. So I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to Guatemala and El Salvador and Nicaragua and really think about this kind of theoretical puzzle. But when I was in the field and I was talking with academics and talking to my friends, what I was most struck by in those conversations was that people wanted to talk about violence. They wanted to talk about the everyday forms of violence that they were experiencing today. And while they really cared about democratization per se, and there were some scholars working on this, what they cared about, about most at this point was to talk about what had happened to them in their bus rides, and what was happening in their colonia, and what had happened to their neighbor's son, and what they feared was going to happen tomorrow. And in those conversations, I think what struck me the most was that friends of mine, colleagues of mine, acquaintances of mine, who had taken phenomenal risks during the Civil War in Guatemala in particular, who had put their lives in jeopardy day after day, they were fearful in a way that really surprised me enormously. So I stepped back from that project and I thought, you know, what I really want to do is to understand the violence that seems to have emerged, that has emerged in a region in the aftermath of authoritarian rule. So let me just show you a, um, a figure. It'll, I promise it will be the worst figure, that uh, re reproduction of the PowerPoint, just to give you a um, a black and white image of the, the kinds of uh, data that is oftentimes bandied about. Because it turns out that violence in Guatemala and El Salvador, um, as I had just mentioned, is not peculiar to the region. In fact, people who have looked at Latin America as a whole have noticed that it has experienced amongst the highest regional homicide rates in the world. So for example, in the early 2000s, and here's a, a quote from the WHO, while the global average in 2000 was a homicide rate of 5 per 100,000, the estimated average for Latin America was 27.5. 5, 5 versus 27.5. The highest for any region in the world, although some people would argue that perhaps Africa was uh, was competing for that position. And of course, those who have worked in this area, and many of you in this room have, would know that children and youth in particular are the victims of this, of this violence, particularly men of the ages of 15 to 24. Moreover, the IDB, who has actually looked at this over the many years in a 2007 study, estimates, and I quote, that the number of homicides by firearms in Latin America is triple the world average. So clearly something is happening in the region. An incredibly important phenomenon has happened in the aftermath of military rule where the human toll has been significant, phenomenal, impactful in the most horrific of ways. And as many of the scholars in this room and also um, in affiliated departments 
um, like Holston and Caldera, as, long as, as well as O'Donnell in his earlier work, has noted that the violence that you see happening in the region has restricted the quality of democracy that people are experiencing today. It's impacted their concerns not only in day-to-day -day interactions, but also as citizens as they go to the polls and the like. So the question really that has motivated my research in the past few years and part of what I want to share with you today is why? Why is this violence so high in this contemporary period, in this post-military period? Why is it high now? Why does it seem higher in some places uh, than in others? And within that also to get a sense of sub-national variation in, in the cases that we see. So I have to say at the outset of this very, very long introduction that I could not have done this research without the support and the, um, and the involvement of many graduate students who've worked with me, including Vinay Javahar, Alicia Holland, Yanil Gonzalez, Bethany Park, and others who've really worked with me to gather what is incredibly difficult data to, um, to gather. So what I want to do for the rest of today's talk is basically this. First of all, to give you a sense of the contemporary violence, breaking down that awful black and white um, reproduction, to give you a sense of the violence in the region. Then I want to step back and talk a little bit about the theoretical debates. I put policy debates up there, but given the time, um, we, won't, we won't, probably won't talk about that, or I won't in my formal presentation. And then these are the hypotheses that I'm gonna, going to um, put forth uh, that define the project. And then, if there's time, uh, I'll end with some conversations about citizenship. All right, so let me, let me go uh, on to talk a little bit about the contemporary violence in the region. Because that first snapshot just made Latin America look black, right? Bla Latin America is much worse than other regions. And what we see, of course, from this, um, from this figure, which comes from the World Health Organization figures, is that there is tremendous variation in terms of levels of violence in the region. Again, something that many of you in this room know well. El Salvador and Colombia have had amongst the highest per capita homicide rates in the region. We shouldn't be surprised about Colombia in the sense that it's still experiencing a civil war. But the fact that El Salvador is so high is really quite striking in the aftermath of the Cold War. If we were to take those two very high cases out, Right, so basically changing the vertical axis, you can see enormous variation even amongst the cases that are not Colombia and El Salvador. So let me just say categorically that what we tend to find here, let me translate all these numbers into just a little <laughs> chart for you because it's a lot of uh, data points. What you find is that essentially the countries that seem to have the highest per capita homicide rates are Colombia, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras in recent years. You find that medium levels of, of violence, and by that I mean 10 to 39, which on a global scale is phenomenally high, but on a Latin America scale puts them in the medium category, would include the cat these the cases right here from Brazil onto Venezuela, although as I'll note, Mexico and Venezuela's violence has really increased dramatically uh, in recent years. And then you have a bunch of cases that by Latin American standards are relatively low. So what does this chart then very quickly tell us? I think it tells us a few, it tells us a few things. First of all, that we have low levels in Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Cuba, Peru, and Uruguay. That's kind of interesting, although maybe not surprising for those of us who know the region. We have medium levels of violence in Brazil and Venezuela and Mexico, as, I, as I noted, increasing uh, in those last two categories. And then again, extremely high in these others. Now, the other thing that this chart tries to do is to note that levels of violence have not necessarily been stable over time. And so I, I just chose for the moment uh, uh, the figure, if it changes sort of 10 points, then it, it's showing some significant instability. So again, what does this tell us? First of all, countries that ex have experienced low levels of violence have tended to be relatively stable. That's kind of a striking thing first off. Second of all, very high levels of violence on this other side are, it's very unstable, so again, it's not as though they're always at the highest level. There's, they're high, but there's a great deal of variation. Third, what's striking to me, and I'm going to take Colombia out because again, it's the only civil war case in this, uh, in this grouping, that the highest levels of violence tend to emerge in the smallest countries. So again, I think that's partially a, a, a function of the fact that you have a lot of subnational variation in these other cases, and in small countries, it's just more compact, so your denominator um, is, in fact, quite, quite different. Okay, so this is just some st descriptive statistics to say that we have a lot of variation across the region, a lot of variation over time, and here, just to give you a pictorial 
um, presentation, a lot of subnational variation. So if you were just to look, for example, uh, at Central America, where blue is the highest level, lots of variation. You can't just say Guatemala, the whole country is violent, or El Salvador, the whole country is violent. You could say the same thing. Here's just some more pictures of Guatemala in particular, or El Salvador. Another picture of El Salvador, or Mexico or Venezuela for that matter, right? So if we're going to explain the violence that is actually taking place, we need to start to think about not just which country has the highest levels of violence, but we have to take into account the kind of temporal and geographic variation that is in place. Okay, so what have I actually tried to do then in terms of a, uh, a, a research design? I am a you know, David and Ruth Collier student, so I'm going to ma make a little nod to um, talk about the research design here, which is to say that I'm focusing specifically on homicide, so when I'm looking at violence, I'm not talking about kidnappings and robberies and the like. Incredibly important. The data is even worse than it is in terms of homici homicide, so I'm looking at homicides in particular. Two, in terms of the research that I've done, you know, on the one hand, I'm looking at the region as a whole, but I'm really trying to focus in particular on cases where there is high and medium and low levels of violence in the region. And what this graph shows you is that Central America provides a particularly important testing ground or, or a place to evaluate why. Because you have amongst the highest levels of violence in the region, Costa Rica and Nicaragua, however, in particular, are very, very low. And as I've highlighted before in other places, I think this is fascinating because Nicaragua, like Guatemala, like El Salvador, has very high levels of inequality, has had civil wars, has had to deal with very significant histories of violence. And yet in this contemporary period, we have quite a lot of variation. So I'm looking at the region as a whole, but I'm particularly zeroing in on the Central American cases and then uh, looking towards Mexico and Venezuela, which, uh, well, particularly Mexico, which has had um, a lot of spillover effects. Okay, so of course you want to ask yourselves, and as you have, what is actually going on in the region? And I think that scholars in the past have tended to think about why the violence is so high have historically tended to think of explanations which are very region specific. So when they've talked about Central America, they tended to look at arguments about the Civil War. And when they've looked at Brazil, they've tended to look at arguments about inequality. And then sometimes in you know, World Bank studies and the like, they've also brought up arguments about civil society. And I want to go through these because I don't think they're actually explaining the violence that is in place, and yet they're so prevalent in terms of many of these arguments. Okay. So let me first of all talk about Civil War legacies. Much of the argument that came out, particularly uh, um, uh, in the late 90s into the 2000s, talked about Civil War violence, or talked about the violence, particularly in Central America, in terms of civil wars. And the arguments went something like this. In the aftermath of the very difficult Civil War periods that we saw in the region, you had the demobilization of arms, you had the legacy of militarized states, you had the destruction of families that had experienced incredible violence during this earlier period, and even arguments about the habits of tolerance for violence. And Chuck Call was a, wrote some particularly important things uh, in this regard. I think, as I've already hinted at, this really is not explaining the violence even in the Central American cases that experienced the Civil War to begin with. So I'm not saying Civil War is unimportant, but I don't think it's explaining the violence that we see today. Why? Well, first of all, we find that violence has surged in countries that did not experience civil war. This is certainly true throughout the region, but it's even true of Honduras. You could arguably say Honduras was part of the civil war, but not the same as in the other regions. So you have high violence in non-civil war cases. You have relatively low violence in countries that did experience civil war, and that would be the case of Nicaragua. And even in countries like Guatemala, where the evidence would have seemed to have been the strongest, if you look at the subnational patterns of violence, these are the country, these are the regions, this is 2004, but it doesn't change a lot over the following years, where the violence is the highest today, but this is the region where the Civil War was largely fought. So in other words, even subnationally within these countries, the, the, the geography of the Civil War of violence is not, is not being replicated today in terms of high levels of violence. There's a shift eastward and there's a shift northward 
although as Beatriz knows better than anybody in the room, the war does move into the Petén in later years, but you would expect the violence, to, if it was really civil war violence, would have been replicated in the places where families had been destroyed the most, militarized states through the patrullas and the like um, had been the most significant, and yet that is not what we find happening across the region, within Central America, or even in a, in a civil war case like Guatemala. So, this leads me to say, obviously, that I think civil wars matter, but not in the simple way that many have argued um, in the past. What about patterns of inequality? And this has oftentimes been the argument for scholars of Brazil. It's sort of the first argument would be, why is it so violent in Brazil? Well, Brazil has had very high levels of inequality. Maybe that is what is generating the kinds of violence that we see today. And in fact, if you look at studies that look at the relationship between inequality and homicides, and the World Bank has um, has done several of these studies. There's one in particular by these three authors. I can't pronounce the first man's name, but it's something like Fajna Silber, um, Letterman and Loiza, who have um, who have written this kind of work. And you, several of you are smiling, so I guess you've studied this piece together. No, it's, it's probably the, the Hispanic version of Fine Silber. There you go. <laughs> All right, so it's. Fine Silver, Lederman, and Loaiza, I have no idea, but these three um, folks who have done econometric studies of inequality, and they've looked across the world, advanced industrial cases, Latin American cases, and the like, and what do they find in this econometric work? They would find, like you might predict in a study of Brazil, that high levels of inequality overall across these different regions of the world tend to support high levels of violence. So that might lead you to think that that, in fact, might also hold true for Latin America. However, in that very same study that finds these statistically significant findings for inequality, they also note that inequality um, doesn't seem to have the same impact on Latin America. And now I have to put on my glasses to read my, my little um, scratch here in pencils. What they actually find is that there are higher homicide rates than inequality would suggest for Latin America, first of all. But moreover, those findings are not necessarily statistically significant. Where there is some statistic, statistical significance might be in terms of robberies. But inequality is not necessarily, see, doesn't seem to actually explain in these econometric studies what is actually happening in terms of the levels of violence we find. There's something particular about Latin America that's in place. Now, I'm not an, uh, I don't, I'm not an, a, a, um, an economist, and I don't do econometric studies, but I did tend look at, even just looking at the Gini coefficients that have come out um, from ECLA from an earlier period, and even looking at these figures, which are Gini coefficients across the region from low to very high from 1990 to 2002, what is it that we find? Well, we find, again, that there's no simple correlation between inequality in the region and violence in the region as well. Very high violence of cases in the region fall across all of these categories, right? So there's no simple relationship between inequality and violence. Low violence cases also occur across all these categories. Um, and the only one exception that I would note to saying there's no pattern is that the very, very low levels of inequality, yes, these are the cases that seem to have the lowest levels of violence, but the rest of it, it's too blunt of an instrument to explain to us where the violence is occurring. So again, these very large World Bank econometric studies, they don't seem to be explaining the region in any simple way. What about civil wars? And here I'll just go through this more quickly. There's been, again, all these studies that have said, well, maybe you have to look, I'm sorry, I said civil wars, civil society. Maybe it's the ways in which society is organized that can help us to understand where the violence is occurring. So where you have denser um, uh, civic uh, civil associations and the like, maybe they can prevent people from joining gangs, maybe they can place a check on people engaging in more violence and the like. Moser and McElwain have done a lot of these kinds of work. I could tell you stories that go either way, where civic associations, yes, maybe they can place a check. There are lots of anecdotes from Nicaragua that would highlight this, but I can also recap stories about how civic associations can capture people for violent ends as well. And lots of scholars have um, written about this, particularly in the case of Brazil. Okay, so these are what I saw when I started the project is the three prevailing arguments, and I don't think they're really doing the lion's share of the comparative work. So what, what do I think is going on? I think there are three things that are helping to explain the patterns of violence. And I need to say here, I'm not explaining all violence. I'm really trying to explain categorically different levels of violence. So I'd like to walk through um, each of these. And with each one, the, the sections will get shorter and shorter in terms of time. 
So the first one will be why. At the macro level, I think what's happening is the violence is mimicking the changing geography of transnational illicit economies, and not the production, but the trade and transit of illicit uh, economies in particular. <coughs> This used to be a very surprising thing to say a few years ago. Now, with the discussion in Mexico, not so much. But it has a more regional scope um, than, than the Mexican case alone. Second, I'm going to make an argument about states. And then third, I want to focus on micromechanisms. So let me, let me walk through what I think is going on here. OK. So the first thing to note here, why is this happening now in such a, a dramatic way in some places compared to others? As I've noted, even though it's a mouthful, I think that what we really need to do is to move away from those prior kinds of arguments to look at what's happening in the economy, to look at what's happening in the illicit economy in particular, and to look not just at the production of drugs, which tended to be the US focus in the past, but really to look at the changing geography of the trade and transit of illicit drugs. So here's a very sensationalist uh, uh, figure, but an important one nonetheless. If you look at cocaine, which has become one of the highest illicit commodity flows in the world, you can see um, this is in terms of just seizures. What is happening in terms of this illicit economy? There are a very wide range of goods that are happening, drugs, smuggling, human trafficking, auto rings, money laundering. We talked about some of this over breakfast. But I'm going to focus on drugs in particular and cocaine here in particular um, because Latin America has become not only a world producer of cocaine, but the trade and transit of this good has had phenomenal consequences. So just to give those of you in the room a little bit of background, South America produces an estimated 900 tons of cocaine annually. And the value of that drug flow rivals that of the legitimate economies of the nations throughout which it passes. So this is a phenomenally important part of the economy, which we will miss if we focus on the legal economy alone. OK, so part of what I want to suggest, and it looks um, is that it's not the production of this good, but it's the movement of this good that is becoming consequential. Why do I say this? If you look at the countries that have produced the um, cocaine in particular, these are the Andean cases of Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. These are not the cases where the violence is the highest. Where the violence is the highest is precisely those areas where there's been the trade and transit. So, Again, just to give you a little bit of background here, the flow of cocaine from South America to the US is one of the highest value illicit commodity streams in the world. Moreover, Central America, which I'll come back to, suffers from being the conduit for the highest value flow of drugs in the world. And moreover, 88% of that cocaine going to the US not only passes through Central America in some way, but also happens along the maritime route there, with the overwhelming majority ending up in the United States. So let me here give you an image that highlights this a little bit more. What do we see from 1998 to 2000? You can see in that green section, the Caribbean used to be the main uh, region through which drugs flowed from um, the Andes to the United States. That starts to diminish over time. And you can see, in particular, the rising movement of those drugs through Central America uh, and Mexico, um, with a decreasing amount happening uh, directly. So something is going on here, right? The movement of the drugs, the movement of these illicit goods, goods has changed the geography. And what I'm suggesting to you is these are precisely the regions where the violence has increased. Moreover, if I were to give you a snapshot and you were to look subnationally, these are violence levels within El Salvador. You'll see that violence is the highest in, in this year, but it, it's replicated mostly in subsequent years. This is La and La Libertad. These are amongst the highest uh, uh, places of violence uh, in the region. And what do we actually find? These are oftentimes the ports, the, the port cities. Again, these are the areas through which the, uh, these illicit goods are actually moving. So the major port cities have tended to be the highest. Same is true in Guatemala. So if you look at Escuintla, Petén, and Itzabal, these are either port, the areas in the region that have the um, most significant ports, or they're very important border areas for the movement of the goods. But then uh, now is commonly referred to as an airplane graveyard because of the movement of drugs through that region. But then, I'm sorry, Escuintla um, and, and um, 
Itzaval had very, very significant ports. Right, so something is happening in terms of the movement to Central America. Something is happening subnationally in terms of where that violence is the highest. And I'm suggesting it has to do with the trade and transit. Now, I'm not uh, 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 focusing in particular on Brazil and Mexico, but based on the secondary research that I've done, and again, I'd be curious to hear from the rest of you in the room, you can make a similar argument that some of the highest violence in Brazil has happened around port cities, and certainly in Mexico through studies by uh, lots of scholars who are now increasingly working in this area, as well as data from the Transborder Institute in WOLA, they're finding that the violence is highest along the border areas, not necessarily throughout the region as a whole, throughout the border areas. Okay, so the first point that I'm making in a very kind of brief way is that we need to look at the changing trade and transit of these illicit economies because it is mapping on to where the violence is the highest, both at the national level and seemingly also at the subnational level. But I want to suggest to you that that really begs the question and leads into the second question, why are these goods being moved through some countries and not others? The port city part is easy, but why are they moving through Guatemala and El Salvador and not Nicaragua, for example? What is actually going on here? Number one, and number two, why are they resorting to violence? Because as I'll say at the end, Organized criminals don't prefer to use violence as their first strategy. It's something they use under other circumstances. So what I want to do then is to move to the second question. Why, how do we understand where these goods are being moved? I've just mapped on um, very, very quickly that there's a, there seems to be a pattern geographically, but how do we understand where they are actually moving? And here I want to suggest, and I'm going to become I want to be really um, upfront here. I think this is one of the hardest things to demonstrate for reasons that we can talk about during the Q&A. But I want to suggest here that, the, that, that the, the illicit economies are growing in areas where you have either state weakness or state complicity. So let me unpack that with you um, for, um, for a few moments here. All right? Because what I want to suggest here is that you need to look at the interaction at the second factor of between the illicit actors and the decisions they're making and the, the kind of reception they think they will get from particular states. And the calculation I want to suggest is that countries with relatively weaker states or which seem as though they will be complicit in this process are the places that are going to be the most amenable for the development of these kinds of illicit economies. They're going to attract organized crime. They're going to provide a more propitious ground for gangs. There's a slightly different story for those two different organizations. So let me focus a little bit more on the DTOs or the organized um, crime than, than the gangs per se. Because the argument here is that where you have weak states, it is harder for them to control those territories. So the Biten in Guatemala, there's not a really good, strong state presence in those areas. Or if you have a stretched judiciary, it doesn't serve as a deterrent. And where you have state corruption and complicity, as um, uh, Holston and Caldera have highlighted, it's also going to be easier for these economies to develop. Why? Because I think that what's going on here, and it's hard for you to read this, is that when we think about these illicit uh, actors who are overseeing these kinds of economies, they're business people, right? They're business people who are trying to figure out where they're going to make the most profit. And so I think there are at least two decisions that are in place. One is just a geography reason, which I, I didn't put up as a main factor because I think it's particularly obvious, right? You're going to move the goods through the region that are closest to the market that you want to move. So you're, it's unlikely that um, organized crime is going to move to the Pacific coast of Chile in the same way, or landlocked Paraguay, as they will move to the Central American Isthmus or the Caribbean, which is the most proximate to the United States. So the first decision is a geographic region, uh, decision. I don't think that's the most interesting part. But I think the second one is they're going to look at the places where they think the monitoring is going to be less or the complicity is going to be the highest. So this just says, to walk you through this, that they will avoid the places where there's increased monitoring. The Caribbean in the 90s, increased monitoring, they move. And they're going to avoid the countries with a stronger rule of law institutions. That would be Chile, Uruguay, Costa Rica, and I'm going to suggest to you Nicaragua compared to the rest of the region, versus moving to the areas where the, the, um, where the states are going to be the most complicit or the weakest in that kind of response. And I think that's what's happened actually in Central America. Now I said that I'm having, I think this is a tough 
thing to work on, state complicity or state weakness. And I want to be upfront with you about why that is the case. Well, first off, let me say I'm looking at the police and courts in particular, and within that particularly the police. But as Steve Wilkinson has noted, and as many of you perhaps have found, it is extraordinarily difficult to assess state capacity and to check against circular reasoning. It's very, very hard to do this, especially when you're looking at the capacity of public security agencies to check violence. So it's hard to disentangle this. I think that's true. So I took a look at some of the quantitative data from the World Bank and other places. The short of it is they were, it was not very helpful. I didn't find any significant variation in that regard. I looked at indicators of complicity. This is from uh, work from the Americas Barometer. Jose Miguel Cruz, who's one of the leading scholars of Central America, has worked on this. Um, and what you find here is that um, this is a, uh, asking about, do you think that the police is involved in crime um, in the region? What you find here is that above 40% perceptions of police complicity are occurring from Brazil. Where is Brazil? right here on up. So there's a lot of perception of complicity happening um, in the region, although not all cases above 40% have high violence. However, all cases with high violence are above this level. So we know, it seems that there's a high level of complicity, but this is not really helping us get at that, at, at that dynamic in particular. So what am I looking at? Uh, and this is also from Jose, Jose Miguel Cruz. If you look at basic things about police officers and pay and the like, it's also not helping to explain the variation. So what have I been looking at? I'm trying to look at state, state presence in terms of role specification. In particular, does one have a good understanding of what the role of the police is relative to the military? It seems to be relatively clear in Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay relative to the rest of the region, although there's very poor role specification for many of the other cases. And I've also been looking at something uh, which is called homicide clearance rate, which is essentially an effort to understand if they're actually just identifying a suspect for a given crime. We're not even talking about putting them in prison, just are they actually identifying a suspect? What do we find? If you look at homicide clearance rates, and I don't have good data over time, what you'll see is homicide clearance rates are, um, uh, actually let's do it the reverse way, murders without suspects. Or, um, Hold on one second. This is actually not as clear as I wanted it to be. But essentially what you find is, is that the homicide clearance rates vary quite a lot across the region. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to get at to look at the variation. Now let me show you this, which is a little bit clearer. If you look at Nicaragua in terms of belief of the, of the police the police is involved in crime, and remember the central uh, comparison I'm trying to make is with Nicaragua versus the rest of the region. You'll see Nicaragua is much closer to Costa Rica than the rest of the region, so that's kind of interesting to me. And if you look at some of the qualitative research, and I'll just let you read this quote, it says, statistics indicate that Nicaragua is arguably the second safest country in Central America, that's after Costa Rica, and it also has the least law enforcement capacity, at least in terms of raw numbers. But, and this is the crucial point, Nicaragua's police and prison system are regarded by some experts as the best in the region. They're considered to have lower levels of complicity. They're considered to have higher esprit de corps in terms of their emphasis on a professional kind of institution. Um, and they're, they're considered to be uh, um, uh, particularly strong in this regard. Now, this is actually very interesting to me because what I want to suggest to you here is that the quantitative data is not getting at what the qualitative research that people share um, is suggesting. So if you, how many of you have apart from Beatriz, actually have spent time in Central America or are from Central America. All right, so I think you might agree with me, but let me know if you don't, that in general, the Guatemalan police is considered to be a kind of scary institution, not necessarily as someone, uh, an institution that you could depend on. Would you agree with that, Beatriz? Okay. <laughs> you might feel the I same. <laughs> you might feel the same way about the, the Salvadoran police are not as scary as the Guatemalan police. They had major reforms in an earlier period, but still not seen as necessarily being trustworthy. You wouldn't necessarily call on the Salvadoran police if your place was robbed for fear that they might use that information to rob you again. But if you talk to people about the Nicaraguan police, there is a sense of pride in the institution. There's a sense that the police will more or less act as they're supposed to act. And the police chief, who, who last I checked was Aminta Granera, 
If you talk about her, the phrase that everybody uses, Thini Mistika, this is a woman who is committed to the goal of serving the police. There's a certain esprit de corps in the police. So it seems that the institution itself is more professional and it's playing more of a deterrent role. So if you go back to that earlier set of, of arrows, what I want to suggest is that the, the DTOs are smart not to be moving into Nicaragua because the sense is that the police will hold them to account more in this in this re, in this country than in in the other ones that are in place. So all of this is by way of saying I think state complicity matters and state weakness matters. It's an extremely hard variable to actually unravel. The quantitative data only goes so far in terms of allowing us to get at this, but the qualitative interviews that I've done seem to substantiate this. And actually, Jose Miguel Cruz, independently, has arrived at the same conclusion, which is really, really quite interesting. Now, I could go through lots, lots of other anecdotes about the complicity and the involvement of the Guatemalan police. Um, I will spare you all those details, but I will tell you that these police institutions have many times over um, uh, fired um, uh, many officials of various rank for being involved in the drug trade, for being involved in corruption, and yet there's still a strong sense that they continue to be uh, complicit, whereas, again, the Nicaraguan case is really quite different. All right, so I know we're coming up against time, so let me try and quickly go through this last point. Because if the first one is telling us the geography of, of the violence mapping onto the illicit trade, and the second one is saying, OK, well, this might explain where the trade is actually going to develop, it still begs the question of why these organizations would actually deploy violence. So anybody who has worked in organized crime, I grew up in Providence, where actually the mafia was quite a significant part of our, our uh, our daily conversations, but they didn't always use violence. And why is that? Because organized crime, for anybody who studied the Italian case or other cases, you know that the, that the organized crime wants to have hegemony over a region, and they want to use the fear and the threat of violence, but they don't necessarily want to deploy violence on a regular basis. It's very costly, economically speaking, and it always brings back retaliation. So for them, the best scenario would be hegemony in a particular situation. And this we know from all of the studies that have been done of Italy and the like. What I want to suggest to you here is that the rising violence that we see is occurring not just in the presence of the drug trafficking organizations or just in the presence of the gangs. It's occurring at this micro level when you have competition to control those trade routes for the DTOs or you have competition to control territorial enclaves if we're referring, which I have done very little in this talk, to the gangs that are playing such an important role in Guatemala City, in San Salvador in parts of, of Brazil and the like. So this is an argument then about the competition for control of those specific trade routes. And I could again go through many different um, kinds of illustrations, but I'm aware of time. So let me just show you what I've done here and then try and wrap up with some conclusions. What I've suggested, and you'll see I put researching because I'm very much at the stage of still trying to gather, um, uh, I'm still in the process of doing the research to um, to flesh out these arguments. But the first thing I'm noting is, is that if we're going to look at violence, we need to take illicit economies much more seriously as the point of departure and look at the kinds of decisions that actors are making in terms of where they're actually going to move. And so this just gives you a sense um, pictorially of, of the kind of argument that I've made. And these are just some figures for the sake of time. I'm going to rush through those very quickly. I want to end with just some comments about citizenship. Because the violence that we see on the ground is fundamentally affecting the ways in which people experience citizenship, not just that they fear. People are increasingly fearful for their daily lives. But you can see that even in terms of their understanding of the role of the state, in a 2010 survey where people at, were asked about you know, guarantee of freedoms, rights, and opportunities, you can see that protection against crime was extremely low. There's a sense that the state, in that kind of classic Cobesian sense, is not fulfilling its responsibility of providing protection uh, against crime. Although, very interestingly, people apparently feel that they have a lot of freedom of religion, which is, is also quite interesting. So this is affecting the ways in which people understand their relationship to the state. It's affecting people's electoral decisions, certainly in terms of how they are voting. And in Central America, this has been a very important concern as well. So let me just step back for a moment and just make some broader theoretical points here, which should be obvious, but I just want to end on this note. 
And this is by way of saying that when scholars have tended to focus on citizenship in the region, and I'm one of these people who's written a lot about citizenship, many of us have tended to focus on the very formal aspects of politics and social service delivery and the like. We've started with that T.H. Marshall sense of what those citizenship rights are, civil, political, and social, and the like. And then we've tended to focus on formal institutions, and increasingly people have started to look at informal institutions as well. And I think that what this study, I hope, is partially highlighted highlighting as many as well as some of the work of others around this room is that if we're going to think about citizenship in the region we need to be thinking much more explicitly about how illicit practices and illicit economies are affecting people's rights as citizens because after all one of the basic points of departure is that as citizens we're supposed to have our freedom from violence protected that's I mean Paul is a theorist so I, I, you know you obviously could go on at length about Hobbes and the like but that was, that's the, even the starting point. Even T.H. Marshall doesn't even really theorize that. We assume that states are supposed to give us freedom from violence. And yet we find in the region that this is not at all the case. So we need to be thinking first about, about not just formal and formal practices, but we need to be thinking more seriously about informal institutions, number one. Number two, what I think the study also highlights for us is that we need to be taking subnational and territorial politics much more seriously. That rather than thinking about violence as it's Mexico's problem or it's Guatemala's problem or the like, we need to be thinking about the subnational manifestation of that problem. One, because there's variation, but also two, if we're going to be thinking theoretically and in terms of policy uh, responses, these are subnational issues and they need to be targeted as such particularly because these illicit actors are trying to control territories and they're competing over the control of that territory, which I think is, is affecting the violence. And finally, and I have to say this was very much inspired by ideas that came out of Guillermo O'Donnell's World Development 1993 piece about the low intensity citizenship and the ways in which states do or do not um, fulfill the role that they're supposed to play because I think that at the end of the day citizens face in Latin America in particular a practical and a political dilemma and what is that practical and political dilemma at the end of the day people want to build up a state that can provide for the basic rights that are being denied them particularly the security issues that I noted and absent these kinds of states that can provide these kinds of security rights, citizenship is not just low in that O'Donnell sense, but it is fundamentally curtailed. So here's the dilemma. How do you move forward when the state itself is complicit in the violence? And how do you move forward when the state itself has had a history of human rights abuses? You're turning to the very institution that itself has been complicit in the process. And to my mind, politically, that is the most complicated issue of all. Come on there. Either way, but I'm going to sit down and join oh. everybody. <laughs> Why don't you recognize me? Okay. All right. Yes. Um, thanks so much. It was uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question about Venezuela, which you mentioned about the Ben didn't quite hit on because, and I've had some bad experiences with the police. The only people around me in Venezuela were the police. <laughs> so, <laughs> anecdotally, it makes sense. That part of your argument, mm -hmm. like the drug trade sort of centric piece of it, I don't know all the details about Venezuela, but I don't think of it as, as central to the drug trade of Central America. So the why part of it, right. um, the where and the other things make sense, but sort of driving factor doesn't make as much sense to me for Venezuela. Yeah, and I completely cede that point. So I, I, I originally did not start off thinking I was going to work on Venezuela, but I'm, I'm aware of the fact that I actually need to do additional research. I haven't actually done the research other than that map that you see um, of the region. My understanding, but this is now more at the hypothetical level than, than otherwise, is that actually there has been increasing trade through the ports in Venezuela, but I think that it's a broader issue than that, than that alone. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off on that really good empirical question because I haven't done the research yet on that. Yes, Ben. Yeah, so thanks, this is a great time. I wanna especially applaud you know, your focus on, first of all, Nicaragua, which is a real puzzle and really worthy of further investigation, and also drawing the attention to the, the illicit trade and especially the cocaine trade. 
I guess I kind of wanted to push you on two pieces of your argument. Mm -hmm. One is, um, so, so state capacity versus geography. I just wonder if, I mean, it's a compelling argument that you present, but you can also easily imagine it going in the other direction. I mean, mm -hmm. the drug traffickers sort of corrupt the police wherever they go. And maybe they're just choosing places that are close to the Mexican border, and that's where they corrupt the police. And they just didn't choose Nicaragua, and that's why Nicaragua's police are still relatively not corrupt. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of money involved. Mm -hmm. And those salaries across those countries are very low. Mm -hmm. So how would you know, in other, in other words? How do you know that the state capacity thing is really antecedent to the choices of where these drug traffickers are, right. are trying to, uh, to traffic? Also, in the geography thing, it, you know, so this gets to a larger question, which I have about your dependent variable. Uh, so I wonder if these homicides, how homogenous they are, and how much all of them are really about um, sort of this kind of conflict among organized crime groups, and what portion of it is more atomistic, um, and even really how you draw that line. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we talk about organized crime groups, but you know, a couple of guys standing around on the street fighting with another couple of guys on another corner. Is that an organized crime group? Or are mm -hmm. we talking about the Zetas moving into Guatemala? Mm -hmm. and, and that, I, so, you know, that raises the question for me, you know, how much of the violence can this approach explain? What portion of the violence, if it's worth trying to disentangle that? And it gets back to the geographic thing. I mean, I can absolutely understand why Petén is a battleground for organized crime groups. It's on the border of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a capital city in Central America, maybe not so much. I'm not really sure why the turf over neighborhoods in a capital city is that important, mm -hmm. especially if domestic consumption of cocaine is small relative mm -hmm. to what it is in the woods. These are great, great questions. So I want to thank you. I, I would agree with your first point, and I, I hope that I was. Um, I hope I was clear enough during the talk that I actually agree that studying state capacity is phenomenally difficult for that very reason that you noted, which is it's extremely difficult to disentangle the outcomes, first of all, from, the, from this very measure of state capacity that you have, number one. And number two, as you rightfully note, there is a recursive effect. So even if you grant for the moment my argument that low state capacity or weak state presence actually is in the, it makes it it increases the likelihood that these organizations will move into that region. It is also clearly true that once they're in that region, corruption is actually also going up. So I, I will grant that particular argument, but I will say this is where I think the Nicaraguan case is actually helpful. And I'm going to first note that, and then I want to come back to your point about geography, which is that the, the Nicaraguan police <coughs> is fascinating for many reasons. First of all, if you look at measures of corruption and, and, and the like in um, Nicaragua, Nicaragua has terrible levels of corruption. So I'm not saying that the Nicaraguan state as a whole is different than the rest of um, Central America. But perceptions of complicity and, and corruption and the like are terrible for Nicaragua. But it is also true that the police is um, extremely uh, 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 professional Again, I could tell you lots of stories going back to the Sandinista Revolution about what actually happened to the police, but the police became professionalized in a certain way. Now, I don't entirely buy the argument that Nicaragua would not have otherwise been a important um, ground to move the drugs, because after all, Panama was an important area for the movement, and Panama is further south. So it doesn't have to only be that you're going to be the most proximate to Mexico, the most proximate to the United States, although, as I noted, I think that matters. But Nicaragua is close enough to Mexico, especially for the maritime route, that you could have used Nicaragua as a, as a movement area, just as you had used Panama uh, in, in, not you literally, Ben, but one had used <laughs> Panama in earlier, um, at, at earlier time. Really right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, but t David will tell me later. So, um, so, so I think that you're right. Guatemala, all things equal. All things being equal is going to be more likely to be an area. But that doesn't mean that Nicaragua wouldn't have also been an attractive area had the levels of corruption, in fact, been higher because they had been moved further south and they had been moved through the Caribbean. So it doesn't prevent that actually from, from moving forward um, uh, in that regard. In terms of your second question about how, well, actually, the second and third question combined. The first is to, to what degree am I explaining 
all of the violence. And again, as I said in the beginning, I, clearly I'm not explaining all of the violence. There's, you know, domestic abuse that's occurring. There's lots of other violence that's occurring. But I'm trying to explain this categorically why it seems to be so much higher in some cases than other. And can I give a fine-tuned answer of the exact magnitude? No, because we both know that the data is so bad to even pretend to do that would be a misrepresentation of, um, of what we know. But I do think that as a kind of categorical difference, yes, I think it is actually explaining a lot of it. Now, the second part of it is, is it all just these drug trafficking organizations? And I hinted at this a few times, but I didn't talk about it during the talk, which is that clearly not just the DTOs in San Salvador and in Guatemala City. Gangs are incredibly important, and they have morphed from being what we used to refer to as bandillas, just neighborhood gangs, into much more significant organizations called maras, which are extremely violent. Um, and I actually believe, from what I've worked, the work I've done and the conversations that I've had, are actually fighting for territorial control. But in this case, it's not for the movement of drugs, per se. It's for extortion. So they're controlling neighborhoods. It's also an illicit economy. It's also a kind of parastatal role. It's not necessarily the drugs. And I noted at the beginning, there are lots of different things I'd focus on drugs. But the gangs are <coughs> increasingly involved in this parastatal role in terms of extortion. And the sad story here is that those two are increasingly combining. Right? So that we know that the DTOs are combining, in some cases, with the gangs. Um, in, in, rate, in the last year or so, that is also having implications. So yes, it varies a lot. Um, and yes, I only told one part of the story, but I am also looking at the gangs. And the last thing I'll note is that I've had a lot of these concerns that you noted as well. So one of the things I've been doing with many other uh, graduate students is we've been uh, going through a, the newspapers in, Gu in Guatemala and El Salvador, and we're about to go into Nicaragua in a few months, to look at the ways in which violence is actually being described. Right? And, and what you find from those newspapers is that, of course, there's a lot of atomistic violence that's actually taking place. But there are also patterns that are emerging in terms of trying to control bus routes, and trying to control neighborhoods, and trying to control certain regions. So I'm just repeating now. This can explain all the violence, but I do think it explains an enormous amount. And what it shares across these different organizations is an effort to control territory. Thank you very much for your talk. It's very interesting. I have a brief question concerning state capacity. Um, you touched on one of your sides, briefly touched on the role of courts, but then focused on the role of the police. Uh, could you maybe say a little bit more about what role other state organizations or parts of the state, such as courts, um, play in this? Um, so I, I can, but I have focused. I have focused on the police at this mm -hmm. at this point. But the argument would, would extend in the same way, which is that if courts are not actually holding people to account, and I want to qualify that in a second, if they're not actually holding people to account, then what kind of deterrence actually would even arresting someone actually hold? So again, I'm from Rhode Island. Lots of people were arrested over the years, but were they ever sent to prison? No. So, that's an, so courts have to be part of the process. It's not just actually identifying someone or bringing them to account. Now, I want to qualify that. I mentioned a footnote because just because you identify a suspect, suspect doesn't mean that they're necessarily the right people. And this is, in fact, what has happened in the case of El Salvador. So um, <coughs> courts actually, well, police picked up lots of people under suspicion, increasingly put people into prison. And as we were talking about this morning, actually, it's had a um, unintended consequence, which is to professionalize the very organizations that previously were just you know, gangs in the neighborhood, and they no longer have the tattoos, and they're no longer necessarily um, communicating in the same way. They're much more professional and increasingly operating like um, organized crime. And you know, the same story happened in Chicago. So if you read the work by Levitt and Venkatesh, this is the story of the movement from the 70s to the 90s in terms of sort of regular gangs that become professional organizations through um, imprisonment, actually, uh, um, in, that, in that city as well. We've answered it all. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I'm not a specialist in Latin America. I'm a member of the public, so I'm a little thin on the, on the background. But years ago, I encountered a book written by a, a Greek scholar um, on the Civil War in Greece, mm -hmm. post-World War II. And although this is a civil war and we're talking about something else than civil war, uh, his findings sort of resemble this. I mean, because even, even in the Civil War, 
you still have localities and geographies to contend with, you have mountains and <coughs> plains and all that. And his basic finding, not too surprising, is that, you know, where somebody, in this case it was, you know, communist inspired or communist connected, mm -hmm. um, guerrillas versus the troops of the, of the government, with the United States intervening. Um, in the contested areas, that, sh that showed the highest degree of violence, where, you know, you swarm over back and forth and people denounce, you know, people to other civilians because there are other disputes going on, to the to the force that's in there at the time, and then mm -hmm. there's retaliation when the other forces come in. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if we can look at the drug trade like a civil war, but not in the context that you, know, you mm -hmm. described. It's not about past civil wars, mm -hmm. but it's about the models or the form that civil wars mm -hmm. take. And are these kind of like civil wars, even though there's no, um, you know, there are, there's sort of fighting over logistics, but there's no illicit. You know, that's not the reason for fighting. Right. So can we can we reintroduce the civil war theme, but not as providing a background to these kinds of things? Yeah. Thank you. It's a really interesting question and actually it, it, but you're not in the political you're not in the political science department? I'm just uh, I'm I'm just a member of civil society. Well actually this is wonderful <laughs> but this is wonderful actually because I have to say that, you know, when I was first coming up with this argument, which shows you this has been percolating for a while. Um, and then I read the work by Stathis Kalivas, who has written about the Greek Civil War. Is that the book you're talking about? There you go. That's great. Um, and, and I was struck by the similarities. Um, and, and the argument would be this, for those of you who have not actually read the book. So he's actually looking at the targeting of um, non-combatants. Right? Um, so he's not necessarily looking at the targeting of other Civil War um, actors, but the, the targeting of non-combatants. And the argument here is that where you have um, increased uh, competition, I mean, he has those five categories, so many of you will already know this, but for those where the, where the war is, the, is raging the most, actually that's not where you have a lot of killing of the non-combatants. It's in the more contested areas where you have a disproportionate amount of power that you're going to have the highest level of violence. And where you have hegemony on either end, depending on which side you're at, you're, you're going to have the lowest level of violence against the, against the civilians. And actually, I think that there is a parallel dynamic. But I don't need to use the Civil War as the backdrop to this, which is so long as you're trying to control a certain territory and you're competing to control that territory, that you have a greater likelihood of deploying Violence. The difference in the Civil War model, of course, is that they're 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 fighting against uh, both other combatants, and sometimes, um, well, I guess there, there, there's the parallel there too. The, sort of the they're fighting against other armed combatants, but they're also, in some cases, fighting against other civilians. And I guess the same thing is happening in some of these regions too. Um, so I'm sorry, that was not very coherent. I just want to go back to the opening point, which is to say that actually I, was, I, I, find, it, I find a lot of echo in that, in that comment, but I don't think you need to reduce it to a civil war framework to, to explain that. It's about uncertainty, an effort to control the territory, and deploying violence where, where you can't use other kinds of hegemony to, to assert that control. But thank you for that question. And I should say also, I found inspiration from this book in part because in Stathis's book, and I actually have it written down here, but I didn't quote it, he, as well as in a, a, a book by Chuck Tilly, and the two books on violence couldn't be more different, but part of what they highlight is, is that studying violence is phenomenally different, difficult. And so you're, at this point, we're trying to find plausible claims more than we are necessarily trying to find claims that we can substantiate with the greatest confidence because the data is so poor, and when you're looking at the illicit, it's so complicated that at this point it's sort of best guesses. But people like Ben and others who are doing this micro work are going to allow us to round out that work in really significant ways. So, thank you. Yes, and then. Um, thanks in the for your talk. Um, I have a, maybe two parts of a general question, for kind of following up on, on Ben's point uh, as to how you think about this sort of uh, more organized or maybe controlled versus the atomistic or random mm -hmm. uh, violence and how that plays out in certain Latin American cases where you see opposing tendencies, like for instance, in Brazil, then in general, and I guess maybe in areas such as in Sao Paulo or Rio de mm -hmm. Janeiro, the tendency has been for homicide rates to drop I mean, very dramatically throughout the last decade, sort of halving uh, in the last 10 years. Whereas in Venezuela, it has been the opposite in direction, where it's now corrupted, maybe the most violent city, at least in, in Latin America, maybe not counting 
uh, Central America. So mm -hmm. I mean, and you have two types of relatively organized crime. Or how do you differentiate between gangs on the one hand and drug trafficking organizations mm -hmm. on the other? Mm -hmm. Following that, and then is there a, a danger where you could say, well, apart so some some people would argue. I mean, I have even heard uh, that there is a I make mean, the point that. Uh, some people argue that the violence in, in Brazil, especially in Sao Paulo, has decreased because organized crime has gained a stronger hold mm -hmm. on territories such as they are more able to control mm -hmm. the, the levels of violence. Mm -hmm. And I guess that also would imply that you have a, a state that is either weaker in a sense that it has a less role in the exercise of the uh, police forces, that mm -hmm. we should say, or that it is more complicit in the sense that it is able to carry out the sort of pact with criminal actors to maintain violence at a reasonable level. Mm -hmm. So then you would have sort of a more complicit state, but then also lower levels right. of violence. And uh, finally, so I mean, I'm sorry to take so much time, but also, uh, I mean, how, sort of thinking about taking this research further than myself, I mean, how do you? think about like strategies about going into it since you see as you pointed out so much uh, variation being within each of the countries and maybe to very specific levels like say this particular province mm -hmm. or this particular city and then how do we go about to generalizing for a broader right. uh, set of comparison right so i'm going to take them in, in reverse order um the strategies it's really, really, it's a, it's a tough question, and I, I you know, the, the more I <coughs> work on the, at this very macro level, I have to say the more I wish I had actually focused on one, on one country in particular. But let me tell you why I didn't do that and why ultimately I see this as a collective enterprise, and that's the way to go forward, which is that people, when I started off on this project, people were looking at the country level. And that was part of what made me dissatisfied because I thought that there were very country specific <coughs> arguments that were being put forth. So I remember going to a panel on Guatemala and everybody was talking about the Civil War. All the violence that we saw was all about the Civil War. And I was really struck by the lack of communication that was happening with people who were working in other regions. So that was what made me scale up to this more macro scale. But I will tell you that it, it, it comes at a both a great advantage. Now I get to you know highlight why there are certain prevailing arguments that I think are limited, but it it prevents me from getting down to this subnational level. I mean, if you were going to go even further, you'd want to go down to the municipal level to be able to explain some of these patterns. And I'll come back to this point in a moment, because then you're going to you're going to gain that kind of leverage to be able to look analytically at those micro mechanisms that will maybe be about DTOs, it might be about anomic violence, it might be about the gangs. And you just can't do that when you're engaging in this big uh, comparative study. But that's why I think it's a collective enterprise. No one person is going to actually resolve this. For, you know, and then the book is going to be done, and then everybody else can turn on to the next topic. Um, I, I think it's going to be a collective enterprise because it's a difficult issue, and it's not like some political science issues where lots of people have been working and then you're fine tuning. We're really, I think, at the really at the initial stages of trying to move forward. So for you as a strategy, I'm happy to, to chat about this. I mean, I think that the biggest point is to just be sure that you have some comparative leverage, whether or not you choose to focus on capital cities across many countries or you choose to focus on one country and look you know, subnationally at it at that level. Um, that's not the you know surprising to you, but I think that's that's the way that I, I look at that. I think the more complicated issue than the one that you raise about you know, what level is really how do you deal with gathering reliable data on the illicit. That's the most difficult for me. That's been the biggest question of all, and oftentimes I hit my head against the wall thinking, why did I take on this topic? Um, but the reason I took it on is because it's, I think, politically one of the most important questions. And so not to answer it, I think, is worse than to, than to, um, to take it on, recognizing the shortcomings. So it's that collective enterprise that I, I keep my eye on. Secondly, in terms of this question of um, the example you give from Brazil, the same story is the story of Medellin, right? Um, both before and now as well, which is nobody is saying that organized crime is gone from Colombia and certain cities are experiencing less violence because the crime is gone. It's that there's one dominant organization and they have worked out a deal with other state officials. Right? It's, it's the way to go. You Monopolization. Said, there you go. So, so it's that classic story. It's, and, and I'm glad you raised this because I really want to reiterate, it's not the presence of organized crime or the presence of the gangs that's the problem in terms of violence, I'm saying. 
the, the presence is not explaining the violence. It's the competition either with the state or a competition with other organizations. And the story of Medellin is precisely this in the current period. They dominate, they have a set of, of arrangements, and the same is true of the cases in Brazil. So I think that that, that kind of negotiation and pact making is part of the story. There's a really nice piece by Rich Snyder and Angelica Duran Martinez. Have you seen this piece where they look at Mexico? And part of the study is about this argument of what organized crime wants to do, what the state wants to do, and, and the circumstances under which they can actually arrive at a pact. And so they make the argument in Mexico with decentralization and with democratization, the changing jurisdictions at the level of courts and the like, they shook up the kinds of pact making that had existed in Mexico for a long time. Because organized crime has been in Mexico for a long time. But the, the kinds of pact making that, was, that had been present was thrown up for grabs. And so you started to have a competition for territory in that region as well. So I think your point is, is the flip side of the same story. If you have hegemony, mm -hmm. and hegemony in, in cahoots with a state, Violence will be low. Extortion might be high, but, but homicides will be low. Um, and then the last question of the gangs versus the DTOs, um, this goes back, as you said, to, to Ben's comment. There's a conceptual question here, and there's an empirical question. So this, the, the conceptual question is, what is a gang? And the classic definition of what a gang used to be is it was a youth group that was concerned about controlling neighborhoods. And what they did in those neighborhoods varied. Sometimes it was about, you know, if you think about the West Side Story, image of what a gang was. You know, it was about finding some kind of camaraderie in, a, in an anomic world where you didn't have, have someone. And in the sort of more contemporary period, it was about controlling that area to extort, right? So there was an economic side to that story as well. And I think that, that is, there's, that, that there's, that's the conceptual distinction that's oftentimes made. The age group, the territoriality, the very localized territoriality of that gang, and the, and, and the associated economic pursuits. Organized crime is oftentimes seen as being older, oftentimes seen as being moving the goods, they're involved in money laundering, so the, the kind of um, economic pursuit seems to be a scale higher. And that's oftentimes been one of the distinctions. Now there's an empirical question here, which is that those two things over time start to merge. You know, ten years ago, the, the media and the state would talk about them as the same, and that was really dangerous because they were not. But it is also, it seems to be the case in recent years that increasingly the DTOs are using gang members to be able to distribute the goods locally. So actually the interesting thing about Latin America is that drug consumption in many of these cases was not high, but it is going up recently and it seems to be in part because they're turning to gang members and paying them in kind to be able to, to develop domestic markets. So then there's a morphing that's occurring at that level and a morphing that's occurred alongside the response to increasing imprisonment of the gangs, which has made them more professional. That's an, that's an empirical challenge now. I'd say that's a much more recent thing than these earlier periods that I was talking about. Yes. We have time for one more. One more. Has the scope of your region, uh, research allowed you, or have you uh, begun to think about, assuming you know, everyone recognizes this violence is not a good thing, so then ultimately the idea might be to diminish it or do away with it? Have you come up with any? Uh, ideas for solutions, for policies. whether they're <laughs> realistic or not so realistic, and what they might require? Yeah, it's such a great question. I will say that I, I don't have a good answer to it. But we had a very interesting conversation this morning um, uh, uh, in following up on the Summit of the Americas, which perhaps many of you were following. And one of the conversations that's now beginning to occur in the region is that so long as you have a war on drugs, what we see is that that's actually increasing the violence, at least in the short term. And so increasingly there's a conversation about whether or not we want to decriminalize or even legalize some parts of the drug trade, much like we did with alcohol, which you know, ha can also had violence when it was illegal, and yet there was a decrease in the violence and increasing opportunities to deal with addiction through that. So I think that that's the next wave of conversations that should happen. Politically, that's extremely difficult to move forward, but at least the conversation has begun. That's one part. In terms of the state response, I don't have a good answer for that, but clearly you have to reform the, the um, security institutions, and that has proven to be extremely difficult. You know, Salvador was reformed at the, with the peace accords, and any study of the Salvadoran police in the mid-90s would use that as an example of what you needed to do for police reform. It was supposed to actually really do something. And you know what? 
it, it, has, it has not lived up to its promise. So I think what we know is what, where we want to get, but we don't know how to get there yet. And that's, the, that's, the sad, that, that's sort of my sad reading of where we are in terms of institutional reform um, on, for the police. Well, with that, I'd like to very much thank Deborah for being here with us, and we look forward to seeing her at, at future events. Thank you so much. Thank you.